welcome everybody. <laughs> welcome to the Design for Aging September meeting. We are a committee part of the Boston Society of Architects that meets every two months around the third Tuesday of every month at the same time, 5.15 to 6.45. And it's a place where architects and friends come in to discuss and collaborate and uh, about ideas, issues around design for aging. Um, my name is Philippe Saad. I'm a principal at the Mela Schaefer Architects and I'm joined by my co-chair, Ruth Neiman, principal at LWDA Design. Um, Ruth has been a a co-chair for several years with Diane Dooley, who is not here today. She's on vacation for this month. Um, it's a CEU presentation. So there is a form in the chat for the architects who will be joining us to enter their credentials. I'm putting it again for those who joined us after I put it in the last time. Please fill in the form and the Boston Society of Architects will, will send it to DIA to, to get you the credits. It's 1.5. Uh, HSW credits. Um, I, get, I guess I'll start. Today we're joined by Patty Sullivan and James Fuccione. They are both engaged in a state initiated subcommittee to make communities throughout uh, Massachusetts dementia friendly. It is a first, I think, Patty, right, nationwide. And it's another thing that our dear state is leading in, in, in our country. Um, this subcommittee is charged with developing criteria for dementia friendly design to be included in state procurement process. And uh, we'll go over those details and this effort um, in the presentation. But as you know, designing for everyone is good design and designing with dementia in mind is a plus to everybody. It not only keeps people engaged in their communities and living in their own communities for longer, but it's also good for caretakers, family members. It's also good for our financial system and our healthcare system, keeping people in place in their communities, keeping them out of institutions. Um, our presentation today, or our talk today will be in two parts. There is a presentation that Patty and James will, will share with us and then we would like to engage the uh, audience, all of you in, in comments about this effort. And also hopefully as we finish our session, um, if there are people in the audience who would like to contribute more to this effort by giving more precise feedback to Patty and James uh, on a document that they are developing. It's a long document that will help be the roadmap of how this initiative would be integrated in the state procurement process. Um, I'll introduce the two speakers. Patty Sullivan is director of Dementia Friendly Massachusetts, which is a statewide grassroots movement comprised of organizations, individuals, and municipalities growing dementia friendly communities to become more inclusive and supportive to those living with dementia, their family and their care partners. And Jane Fuccione is senior director at the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, which is a network of leaders in the community, health and wellness, government, advocacy, research, business, education and philanthropy who have come together to advance, to advance healthy aging. So we do have experts in this and people who are uh, really the advocates to develop this program and make our state more dementia friendly. So with this, I want to turn it to Patty and James for the presentation. Thank you very much, Philippe, uh, for accurately describing what we're trying to do here uh, in this bigger picture. It's a really interesting exercise in taking the work that we know about age and dementia friendly work context communities and try to interpret it into a language that architects, designers, developers can all understand. So I'm gonna share my screen and go through some slides to show you where we are in our work. Mm -hmm. 
So Philippe has covered this slide, um, but I just want to add that I work for them uh, in addition to being funded by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation, as James is, I work for the Massachusetts Councils on Aging. So my job is to help councils on aging and communities become more dementia friendly. So James, do you want me to add anything? Just that the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative um, is a statewide network also funded from uh, by the Tuff, Tufts Health Plan Foundation, Mass Councils on Aging support we do. We get support from several organizations, but I think, you know, one of the themes I want to get across is that we are one of the few states that's coordinating age and dementia friendly together. They are separate movements in, in many states and and sometimes in this one, but we we try as best we can to align align the frameworks, the focus areas, the work, the toolkits, all the stuff that comes out to support communities in doing this work. We've done a lot to align all of that, all of that, uh, all of those resources and all the things we try to do and coordinate as best we can. But, um, but yeah, I think we'll continue on as we, as you know, we'll share more as we go. So my job is literally to travel the community or the state. Um, I used to do it in my car and now I do it on Zoom to encourage communities to take on the initiative of dementia friendly. And that's really, as Philippe said, encouraging the creation of a community that allows people living with dementia to engage in life every day. And particularly in this part of the initiative is to get people who are working at senior centers, doing design work, town administrators, town planners, to put on a lens of what dementia friendly looks like. So I spend a lot of time on master plans. I talk to senior centers about their entryways or their hallways or, uh, and encourage them even in the minorest renovations and updating, you know, everybody paints their building, for example, uh, to think about being dementia friendly in that context. As far as age friendly is concerned, uh, it's a movement that started with the World Health Organization aimed at cities, but now is open to any community of any, any size. And, and especially in Massachusetts and in the United States, there are counties and regions that engage in this work as uh, a collective collaborative team. Uh, and we have several of those regional initiatives going on in Massachusetts. But uh, the AARP has taken over uh, administering the designation, the commitment that communities make. And essentially the only requirement is that, you know, a coalition that comes together in any community listen to residents to think about what being age friendly means in that community, that city, town, or region, and then create an action plan uh, based off some of the principles you see on this slide, um, just to advance social determinants of health in the physical and social environment that supports people of all ages. So why do we need both age and dementia friendly design? So I talked about sort of the physical environments that support older adults and of course, people living with dementia but to support aging in community is one theme. We, we, th there's a, a term going around that's been going around a long time called aging in place. And while that's all well and good, it might not always be the best option to age in place if you are an older person in a very large home or whatever, whatever the situation might be. But people um, tend to want to stay in their community in a place that's familiar um, with friends, family, uh, just familiar space. So um, that's what we talk about in communities physically that are supportive as well as socially. Um, and of course, it contains broader benefits. Things that are age and dementia friendly end up benefiting a lot of other people in the community. What we talk about all the time with age friendly is if you make a sidewalk and curb cut that works for older people, 
It also works for families pushing strollers, people in wheelchairs, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think about the themes we'll talk about in a few moments with age and dementia friendly, it promotes inclusion and community cohesion and promotes, uh, uh, I think if I could sort of half joke, it, it makes universal design a little bit more universal. So uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do is just be more inclusive through all of this process and support communities um, in their commitment to support everyone. Uh, next slide, Pat. So again, one step to becoming age and dementia friendly is making physical changes that benefit people of all ages. So we talk about, you know, some communities create intergenerational gardens that give young and old the chance to get together and socialize and create those relationships and just physical spaces that promote or address social isolation and loneliness that, you know, just make communities safe uh, places that are that are walkable, that are bikeable, um, parks and playgrounds that are that are more inclusive of, of older people, uh, grandparents taking their kids to their grandkids, to the playground, people living with dementia. Um, there are all kinds of little things that you can do in a community to make it uh, age and dementia friendly. So communities do that on their own after that sort of community listening step, assessment, action planning and implementation. So next slide, Patty. So what we found about answering the question, the fundamental question about what is dementia friendly infrastructure. Um, so myself, Patty and uh, our our work group uh, has found that things that are familiar, legible, distinctive, accessible, comfortable and safe are all the sort of main themes we talk about when we're, we're talking about dementia friendly. That's what other countries have addressed in, in their design, whether it's um, sort of wayfinding uh, and proper signage that's at eye level uh, and includes maybe logos and text that that kind of clearly describes different things. But but again, as we go along, we'll share some examples of what this all means. But these are the main themes of when we mention dementia friendly. And in your work, you can think about this as we kind of continue on. These are the themes uh, that we promote and the focus areas we promote. So one uh, one example that uh, comes from uh, Pam McLeod at the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, who might be with us in this meeting uh, out there listening, is uh, the difference between uh, a couple of different benches you see here. So uh, the first bench, it does not really satisfy any of those themes. It's not familiar, legible, distinctive, uh, might not be comfortable, and it's probably not safe uh, for an older person or, or people living with dementia. Um, but the bottom example is something that's familiar. Your entire life, you see these in parks and along walkways. You see these uh, outside of public buildings in many cases. So uh, benches with backs and arms so people can rest lean back and use those armrests to, to get up. Um, the benches could be accessible depending on where they're placed uh, and so on and so forth. But you get the idea of trying not to outsmart ourselves and not to say that there's not a place for creativity and sort of artistic design as long as it sort of satisfies those those um, those categories. So Patty, is this still is are you talking about the infrastructure implementation, how we ended up here? Yeah, uh, but I also want to go back and answer oh, sure. the question in the chat. Oh, did not see that. Or what you didn't see it because you were speaking. So, what yeah. is the difference between familiar and distinctive? Right. So, the the top bench example was certainly. I mean, it it may be distinctive, <laughs> but um, you know, it certainly stands out. But it it you know it's not familiar if you see it you may not know it's a bench whether or not you have dementia so people living with dementia would recognize the bottom example as a bench so when we talk about those two things patty am i kind of getting that right but feel free to jump in yeah the the only other thing i will add is that sometimes at least with some of the dementia friendly folks, and I, I really am here to pick your brains, but um, sometimes using something distinctive 
helps get people's attention. So a good example of distinction is a colleague of mine who was hired to help people navigate a really unfriendly parking garage. And so they put outrageous pictures, distinctive pictures outside of the elevators. So people would recognize this, you know, barn or whatever, bright colors or whatever, so that distinctive meant something that really impression, put an impression on their brain and made them say, okay, I need to turn left at the red bench or I need to get off on this floor. What, but trying to find something that would lock into people's brains as they were trying to navigate. So it goes back to the whole notion of wayfinding, which a lot of the dementia friendly, agent dementia friendly work goes back to. Okay. So, oh, um, good. And thank you, Marie, for the question. Sorry, I missed it. Yeah. So how did we end up here? Well, that uh, we are operating under the direction and encouragement of a council created by the governor that is chaired by the Secretary of Elder Affairs, which in Massachusetts is an executive office, so it has its own power. And under that work, under the age Alzheimer's and other related dementias um, subcommittee, we have been assigned, James and I were chaired to, uh, nominated to work on this particular issue. Oh, come on. So our, you know, the basic goal for us is to develop a guide that truly articulates what agent dementia friendly design looks like. And so we have put together, as I'll explain, a document that in layman's terms, and you've seen a lot of layman's terms already, um, we want to translate that so designers and planners and the public can understand because you know, I arrive in a community and I say, okay, we're gonna become dementia friendly and physical infrastructure is one of the things that you need to think about. And they immediately ask me, what does that mean? What does that look like? And if I'm on site, I can walk around and point out things in the building that need to be changed. And I have to clarify upfront that, you know, I'm not asking you to change the world. I'm asking you to think about when you repaint your senior center, when you replace the covers on your uh, toilets, when you change the welcome sign, when, in, when you change the placement of your check-in machine. All of those things are really concrete examples. Um, and I have even funnier ones where I was in a meeting in a small town um, up on the New Hampshire border. And I wanted to go to the restroom before I presented. And I had to go from a room that was brightly lit down a dark hall into a restroom, a handicapped restroom, that then popped the light on. So this is a really bad example. And so I went back out and I grabbed the town administrator and jokingly said, come on, I want you to come to the restroom with me because I want you to see this through my eyes. So, you know, we're trying to embed this thinking in as many people as we can. And, 
just trying to make this knowledge accessible to particularly municipal leaders who don't always think about it. Then we need to further translate the criteria so that dementia and age and dementia friendly design can be incorporated into the state procurement process. So the first step in our work was we had a fabulous intern who collected everything we could find. So a lot of the work that's going on in age and dementia friendly design is around the world, mostly the UK and down under. And so we dug through their documents so that we could see what does it actually mean? And then we took these same categories that are for us ways to talk about age and dementia friendly design and we use them to sort. So, you know, he, on the left hand side of the screen are familiar, legible, accessible, shape, safe, comfortable, distinctive, and then they were broken down into other sort of easily pieced out formats. I'm sorry, I'm looking. Okay. Um, and so we ended up with a document that looks at each of these issues with all the criteria that we, have we were able to articulate. just talking about the risks and challenges along with this work, um, you know, as Patty said, it's sort of translating uh, to basic design components in a language that's widely accepted. So while Patty and Pam from uh, Executive Office of Elder Affairs know a lot about the personal and human experience of living with dementia and what it means when the physical environment and, those, and people living with dementia and their care partners Try to interact with that environment and while we know about communities that are working to become more age friendly we need your assistance and your partnership in thinking through this about um, what is the proper language to use how do we make this real and how do we get folks to to pay attention to in a way that that you know is you know kind of fits within people's course of work so we can so we can make these changes to help uh, communities and buildings and physical environments broadly to be more inclusive. Uh, so agent dementia friendly physical infrastructure may not be viewed as a high enough priority among the folks that we're trying to engage, yourselves included, but also regional planning agencies, local, plan uh, local planners, state agency funders, and so on, um, and may be considered too costly to incorporate. Um, but if you, Patty, thank you. So, but what, but I think our opportunities to create a common language that can be used by all sectors regarding age and dementia friendly design. So it might not even need the label age friendly design, but if we incorporate this language into the kind of usual course of work and create some terms that people can get behind and that people can recognize, then we can embed this thinking, not just the thinking, but actual action uh, into, um, into projects, into planning, into um, you know everything that happens in communities and across the state, uh, embedding the concept of aging dementia friendly design in architectural municipalities and senior community design uh, communities, and clarifying that aging dementia friendly does not have to be a costly effort. As Patty said, we're we're not talking about large changes, and even Pam mentions this all the time in meetings. Oftentimes, these are these are tweaks. These are just considerations. It's a way of thinking. It's a lens at which to look at, at, at um, architecture and planning and community design more broadly. So that we have a real opportunity to lead with this work in Massachusetts and, and take the lessons from you know, different parts of the country, but really all over the world in thinking about how we can advance this uh, to make all of our physical environments across the state more, more inclusive. 
Um, so I think we're getting into discussion now and really excited to, to hear what folks think about this. And also want to just make sure we thank you for all your time and looking through this and, and your consideration of this document probably after this meeting uh, and any comments you're willing to make. Um, and we're not here pretending that we know everything either. We're coming actually to the quite opposite, knowing that we need your help in uh, kind of using this proper terminology and, and figuring out how to make this real and make it applicable. So with that, Philippe and Patty, anything else you'd want to add or Pam? The only thing I want to add is that also on the call is Pam McLeod. Yeah. And Pam is the project manager for this work with Secretary Chen. And Pam, I, you are living in the thick of this, wo uh, this work with us. Anything you want to add? No, I think we did a good job of explaining what we're trying to do. And as James said, we're, we're definitely not the experts. Um, we see the need uh, to be a little more inclusive. Uh, we don't think because oftentimes, or I should say sometimes, uh, people with dementia are overlooked in universal design. You know, I often wonder, is it because it's an invisible disability, you know, a cognitive impairment, you can't see it in front of you as easily. Um, and when you read all the various uh, universal design specifications, you'll see all kinds of physical disabilities uh, being accommodated, but not the cognitive impairments, or the cognitive abilities that we all want to engage in day-to-day -day life no matter what our cognitive or physical abilities are in the future. So it's very important. We try not to overlook that. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Thanks. Thank you, Patty, James, and Pam. Uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress, as you have said. And uh, I have a few questions that I hope will get the conversation going. Um, because I've been involved with you in some of the some of the thinking uh, in the past few months, and something that we know this is not is that it's not a code yet, right? So the difficulty of it being implemented is high, because people are not forced to implement it until it becomes part of a certain document that keeps that makes people want to need to implement this. So the, the question here is, and, and this is open to the group because each one of us does maybe slightly different type of architecture has slightly different clients, focuses on the different aspect of design for aging. And I hope we have people who are not only focused on the aging population and would help us. Um, uh, we thought together about where can this, these criteria be embedded, right? Inserted in some documents that the state utilizes to do procurement. And something um, we talked about is complete streets. Something I'm familiar with is the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, criteria for developer selection for housing, which is mostly on affordable housing. And we have the state purchasing arm, which is DCAM, which this, if it's put in, if some criteria of this document are put in part of the DCAM, uh, RFPs is already a good step ahead. But I would like to hear from others here on the call if, what do they think if there's any other avenues that any of you is working with? Because our focus here, these two, two of those are more focused on buildings, but we have parks and transportation and recreation and and other types of spaces in the environment that would benefit from such criteria. And while folks are thinking about that, Complete Streets does include some consideration of older adults and the MassDOT Shared Streets and Spaces program went a step further by encouraging uh, communities that applied for uh, funding support with, with bonus points for projects that were considerate of the environments around councils on aging, senior housing, but just, you know, village centers, downtown districts, main streets, what have you, and how that was inclusive of older adults. So while we have a little bit of a foot in the door on, on that end, we'd, we'd love to get even further with, with dementia friendly.
Well, you, you said that it's not the law yet, and we all know how long it takes for things to uh, move from the idea, uh, the good idea uh, realm into something that is required by code. Uh, but the, the uh, inclusion of dementia-friendly and age-friendly uh, features as something that would give you an advantage when you bid on a project, I think is, is an excellent uh, start or excellent way to make people aware um, if they wanna get a, a, a public job, a job with the state, job with DCAM, they need to think about these things and not kind of poo-poo that, that that will come later when we try to figure out how to make accessible bathrooms. So the whole concept of universal design that is like the basis of all this because universal, all inclusive, inclusive of all ages. And somebody actually said to me that age friendly is not just for the aged, it's for all ages. So, um, so that the, the concept of inclusivity is really, really important. So the, the, the notion that your committee is taking uh, to embed requirements and recommendations in the pro procurement is a fantastic way to start making people think about it. So I'm just supportive and supporting and strengthening where you already are, as opposed to giving you a brilliant new idea. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I have to say that when we were back in the discussion phase within the committee and I'm listening to the conversation and talking, you know, sort of absorbing, and then I realized that the co-chair of the Aging Services Committee in, you know, the, our uh, legislature said, the way that you get people to pay attention is by putting it into the procurement process. So she is right and she's our advocate. So once we figure this out, we will have you know, Senator Jalen's support, um, but we just, we don't have a way to articulate it yet. So that's why we're here asking for help. And one question might be, what procurement processes do you all pay attention to yes. besides those that Philippe mentioned uh, and what other documents might be helpful for us to take a look at? Sorry, Renee, were you saying something? Yes, and I, I apologize, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no. So my name is Renee Lohm and I am not an architect. I was invited to this session and delighted that I arrived <laughs> last minute. Um, so I am. I, I run a company called Navigator Homes of Martha's Vineyard and Navigator Homes of New England, and we are developers of the small house greenhouse model homes, and we're working to uh, move from community to community to help those communities and private uh, nursing homes and others that want to replace either replace the existing institutional design nursing home from many years ago or start fresh and build either senior uh, housing in the vernacular of assisted living or memory care and or skilled nursing, as well as independent living in a variety of communities where the need is great. So that's the background. Um, we're working with Ruth on a complete redo of uh, the only skilled nursing home on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, we're real pleased of, of the way that the community is receiving the idea of developing greenhouse. And so the greenhouse model, which started with Bill Thomas's idea that elders should age in, in familiar surroundings that resemble what we call real home is now progressing just beautifully uh, as it continues to perpetuate excitement after COVID. And I won't, you know, I could go on and on, but, but I won't. I'll just say that we're so excited that uh, Senator Jalen had introduced the small house design concepts as a form of future, as a form of an act and legislation. 
and we have a call with her tomorrow. So the discussion that we, Ruth and I and others can weave in perhaps to our discussion with Senator Jalen uh, of this discussion can tie beautifully in with the small house design as truly being the only future design that should be uh, perpetuated through whether it's contracting or whether it's the work that we're doing in the private you know, sector, uh, but perpetuating the model and expanding it to the extent that we can. So thank you for listening. And I'm just delighted as a, as a resident who lives in an aged dementia friendly community of Yarmouth on the Cape, I'm very pleased to support your work. I'm very familiar also on the Vineyard, uh, one of our founding uh, members, Patty Moore, was the oh. director. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and Patty is healing well and doing Good. well, for those of you who don't know. She's come through a lot of treatment for cancer, but she is an amazing woman and um, will continue to be our leader on the Vineyard. So I so thought I'd mention that to all of you who know her. Yeah, Patty Moore. Patty Moore is a rock star, Renee, and hopefully yeah. no Cindy Trish and, and the whole. Oh sure, we we'll work with the whole team. Awesome. The team. Yeah, we're we're integrally woven with the whole movement on the vineyard. So. So great to hear. Thanks, Renee. Glad, glad I could join in today. Thank you, Ruth Neiman. So and so this was interesting because I think if we can start kind of creating a web where things kind of meet. Um, and take your familiar, legible, accessible, safe, comfortable, and distinctive uh, buckets or cut categories. And for instance, what Renee was describing is something that is familiar, like the, the, the most familiar that can be uh, is to continue living in the house as opposed to a hospital when you are older, infirm or having any cognitive issues. So um, um, if, if we're trying to figure out how to kind of structure this uh, set of, uh, of recommendations or guidelines or directions, I really like your uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, kind of uh, very similar, like the petals of the um, age-friendly cities. You have these uh, um, kind of categories that will allow you to test whether an idea is um, answering or, or falling into one of these six uh, items. So definitely trying to um, either get rid of or re renovate or um, kind of convert non-friendly, uh, non-familiar, confusing, like not legible environments of a very um, medical model nursing home into a greenhouse, you've got it. So, so that's, um, that's a greenhouse or let's say a greenhouse-like atmosphere. So that's, um, and, and I can think of a lot of other physical attributes that we can look at and I can just throw another one um, that, that is extremely important and that's lighting. Lighting that is either natural lighting or artificial lighting and the impact that good lighting can, can make on a space, on the feeling, on the ability to find yourself, on the ability to function. Lighting is huge. And I always say that if I went into a space that needed a lot of work and I was told you can only do one thing, I would say lighting. So, so that's something that um, we, we can start from that end, like a physical um, um, attribute like lighting and see how that kind of falls into the six categories. And I'm gonna shut up because <laughs> I don't wanna take over this meeting. <laughs> the meeting. The, the challenge I find is how can you make this 
part of something else that's already there rather than something else on top that will require many of us architects usually on and owners on that receiving end to have another standard and I want to say guideline that sometimes most of the time has some conflict with other standards that we're trying to do and then we come in and it gets very complex because there's a lot of we want to advance this, but we know what dementia friendly is. Maybe the majority of us, all of us here in the room does, but we want to appeal to also those architects who sometimes get engaged in a project that is not senior, right? But requires to be dementia friendly and they have no clue what dementia friendly is, or they have no sensitivity to that. There's a, I think, it's the implementation of that is how to embed it, I think, in, in, a, in a guideline that already exists to make it part of it. So it's not just, oh, this is the appendix just for dementia, right? But it's part of everything. everything. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if those six categories, excess, I understand six categories are part of the dementia, but do we think that the implementation of it should take out the accessible because already accessibility is something that is being covered? Like part of the access, accessibility codes. Yes, go ahead, Pam. I just like to, I'm sorry, what are you done? Um, yeah, I'd like to respond to that only because I put together that slide that had the six. Sure. Yes, please. Um, the six icons and the, and this is sort of interesting story when I went into a clip art to look for uh, an image on access I wanted to find the word accessibility with a picture of the brain next to it you wouldn't believe how hard that was there's thousands and thousands of images of the word accessibility with pictures of physical things but mm -hmm. not the brain so that almost shows mm -hmm. you it's sort of an indicator that that's overlooked those cognitive abilities are overlooked yeah. So it could very well be that accessibility should should be replaced by universal design that kind of opens it much more and takes the the laser focus on wheelchairs uh, which is absolutely critically important but not the only thing you know uh, philippe can i pull up that slide yes yes please I actually, I'm referring to it. I have it in front of me, so I'm cheating. Sorry, everybody. Yes, we should put it up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because when I first learned about this, people told me that I should really focus on safety and wayfinding. But then, you know, Pam and others educated me that it's more than that. So, but I just want to put this back up, uh, given the comment that you just made, so that people can look at it again. And I appreciate your, your explanation of familiar and distinctive, because I was confused about these two when I saw the slide without the explanation that went with it. So I think there's a value to clarify this. And I, I, I yeah. now I understand that they are different things. And I think it's with this, this image, it has to have a good balance of form and function. So that picture of the of the um, very artistic looking bench that has form, it has a distinctive form, but the function is not quite there. It's, and and it, it looks like it would be quite uncomfortable and unsafe. And then it's funny when you mentioned, um, Patty, safety and wayfinding, a lot of this turns into that. So there's overlap. For example, if something's not accessible, or not comfortable, it can cause someone with a cognitive disability, especially Alzheimer's disease, become agitated and confused. And so if you're agitated and confused because say your bench is in near a busy intersection where there's a lot of stimulation, a lot of noise, you might just get up and walk into traffic, which actually happens. So that's why there's, there's overlap here and it's a lot of it ends up being unsafe because it's not accessible or because it's not familiar or legible so looking at a building where you have no idea where the door is because it's designed in such a way that it's hard to tell where the door is, that can get someone very confused who has dementia. 
and they may start to wander in an unsafe way. Patty and I joke a lot that we are when we go through communities, we're taking pictures on our on our phones of uh, physical infrastructure examples that may or may not be dementia and age friendly. Uh, so we have, you know, just some things like, you know, if if you think of flashing beacons at crosswalks, completely safe. That's kind of a, a new, I mean, for lack of a better term, gold standard in safety of crossing a street, but it may not be familiar. It's sort of a relatively new thing in infrastructure. So, you know, can we create that awareness about how to kind of use those things or, and sort of just, that's a thought exercise and going through this, about, um, you know, the physical environment. And we lean a lot on the social environment with dementia friendly, I feel like, and kind of creating awareness and getting, you know, uh, Patty, you're, you and Pam and your amazing initiatives to get uh, bus drivers at, at regional transit authorities and councils on aging trained about how to be dementia friendly and recognize signs and how to be more patient and that kind of thing. But there's, there's a lot to be said for the physical environment and improving social determinants. And, and to all that, there's an equity component that mm -hmm. it, a lot of this depends on where you live. And I think we have another opportunity through all this to really support a lot of people. I mean, we talk about the benefits of age and dementia friendly design, but th there's a lot of good that can be done through this. And Philippe, I, I'm intrigued by your, your, your comment, which I think is an important one about where there may be a conflict, right? Mm -hmm. With the other guidelines and other standards. And, I, I know nothing about all the guidelines and standards out there for architecture and design, oh. um, but I just, for some reason, I believe that the, the, the uh, conflicts are the exceptions rather than the rule. Um, and I think in most cases, if you make something Asian dementia friendly, it's actually better for everyone. But I know there probably are conflicts and I'm wondering how, if we could identify where those are, we could keep people from being concerned about that. You know what I mean? Or we could, or we could keep ourselves from providing guidance that then presents a conflict for designers. So the conflict I'm talking about is sometimes when you look at different standards and they have different uh, numbers or dimensions or layouts that they request. Like when you design for the city, they require a certain dimension next to the stove and the oven. When you design for the state only, it has some other dimensions. The turning radius for wheelchairs is different for the state than for MAB. And when you come to overlap, this is, this is where if this becomes a standard, there is way more depth that all of us, you as a team, need to consider that might make things way more complicated and deter people or organization from adopting this standard. That's why I'm, I'm, I don't see this as a standalone standard because I think it's gonna be very complicated to integrate this. Another conflict that I noticed here, and I think these categories need to be maybe explained is Distinctive, for example, let's say distinctive and the, 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 the bench, example of the bench. The bench is, the, is distinctive, but it's not a good dementia friendly object, that metal bench, right? We're, you would right, remember but, it. Yeah, we're, so, we're, we're using the definition and it. Maybe we need another word for it, but a definition used in the UK, in the dementia friendly world, where they define distinctive in a dementia friendly um, the world as yeah. a balance between form and function. So yeah. it's definitely not that, it doesn't have that balance, but yeah, it definitely stands out. <laughs> it's distinctive. Yeah, that, that bench is not even bum friendly. <laughs> so <laughs> this is not an exact, so distinctive in and of its own is definitely not always a good thing, but using okay. something to highlight or to emphasize and to kind of create an image in your brain uh, uh, and your example of coming out of elevators um, in, in some of the uh, large yeah. parking garages, you have also another concept that I really would like to talk about, which is redundancy in, 
and, and having more than one uh, kind of sense, sensory experience in order to emphasize uh, the information. So in some of those, I think it's in, in Logan Airport, you have different sounds on different floors in addition to the images or the colors. So you have like three different things that, that make you remember. I was on the orange floor. There was a, an image of the swan boats and I heard the, the sounds of something or other uh, uh, in, in, on the floor that I parked. So redundancy is really like having more than one sense uh, spoken to is really important for uh, dementia-friendly environments. And, and, and I, have to, I have to hop off, but uh, I, I think we may start using the term bum-friendly, Ruth. Yeah. Uh, oh, yours. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, bums are also universal. So we're all aging, we all have bums. So maybe we'll, yeah, we'll add that to all you. yours. But thank yeah. you for the time and, and thanks, Patty and Pam. Thank you, James, for, you. for presenting Thank to us you. and doing this for all of Thanks. us. Thank you, Philippe, and, and for Ruth. Thank you for your comments. Take care. Oh, I have a question. This is Ann Walters. Um, yeah. I'm working mostly in residential design, but I know in our community, there's a lot of community involvement in um, recently designing elementary schools that, that were being replaced and um, uh, other sorts of even people being involved in what the, the DPW is doing when they're you know, fixing the dog park. And so I'm kind of wondering, is there an effort um, to get your document out just to the general public to sort of raise awareness so that people who are concerned about it can bring it into these other areas way before it gets to be a regulation or, a, or that kind of a document and then possibly make it easier um, for it to become codified in some way? And that is a terrific suggestion. I think our, the issue that Pam and James and I face is that we have a document that is written in complete layman's terms. And so it, it's, I'm not even sure that, you know, I can incorporate Ruth's design or comments. I hope to get others, but I, I'm not sure it's ready for prime time. Once we complete the document, we're gonna to try to embed it everywhere we can. But I think your suggestion of putting it out to the public is a good one. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope I'll see it soon. <laughs> yep. I, what, what, Pam, what's our net, next deadline from the secretary? <laughs> oh, <laughs> December, we're going to present something to her, but I mean, is I'm sure there are many iterations. We're just really now doing research, trying to figure out how to communicate this and make it so that it's easy, so the change won't be difficult and it'll be something that makes sense. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, I, I was very intrigued by uh, Philippe's comment about conflicts. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we, we want to make sure that we're not creating something that will get some eyes rolling. And, and another example that I was I thought about conflict that is not just conflict about dimensions or requirements is the whole concept of technology and automation. And when I get to a public transit station, and I feel like I have to go to MIT to figure out how to get a ticket, that's a problem. So the idea of bringing back some human interaction that can be again, redundant with the automation will make a place um, uh, age-friendly, dementia-friendly, people with um, other disabilities like vision impaired, hearing impaired. When you, when you go to a place and there's nothing there but machines and uh, automatic kind of things that you have to figure out what to do and you can't just say, I need a ticket, thank you, bye. Um, I think that, that would be like 
an example for, for a conflict that we are all going towards technology and automation. And maybe in 20 years from now, talking to a ticket machine would be something that will be the last thing that will remain in your brain uh, after it goes uh, into dementia. But at least right now, that's not the case. Very, very good point. Yes, we've heard that from people who presented to us the council, the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Council. We had folks living with dementia, and one person actually gave that example of going to the subway in order to get to the meeting and not, just not being able to figure out how to get the, you know, the the Charlie ticket. So, mm -hmm. and and I've had my own troubles, and I don't have dementia. I was in a parking lot the other day, and I just wanted to get a little ticket to put on my windshield and took me forever to try to figure out how to do that. So you're right, we have all this automation and it's, it's not very age or dementia friendly. It's in age meaning all ages. Well, you know, Pam, James and I steal each other's slides all the time. And one of Pam's favorite slides is of the, I can't remember, government center yeah. City Hall. Oh. City Hall. So, <laughs> Plus, um, City Hall. <laughs> yeah, it, it, multiple stops have this. You come up out of the tea stop and it's all glass, but you can't figure out where the door is. You would think that it wouldn't be that hard to show where the exit is. Yeah, I actually walked into a, a, a glass door thinking it was an open door because it was so clean. <laughs> and uh, it was, and I got a huge bruise on my knee. And of all places, it was the lobby of the building that the Alzheimer's Association is in. <laughs> but it was all glass. <laughs> I think one thing in your, this is based on your comment, the last comments on City Hall. I think one thing this effort to me needs to convey is that, and I think James mentioned it slightly at the beginning, that this is not trying to diminish creativity and design. And it is more creativity and design can still happen still and putting out products, buildings, signage that is dementia friendly. It's the same thing with accessibility. Accessibility doesn't need to look like it's a network of ramps that lead to a building. It has to be designed. And I think part of the messaging is important for people to accept this as the dementia friendly doesn't need to be ugly or look this way. It, this is part of being integrated. So, um, Patty, I have a question with regards to that draft document. Um, are we interested in hearing from the people in this group who will be um, um, available and interested to go through this and use the track changes and add some comments um, to this, even even acknowledging that this is really preliminary draft, uh, just kind of throw thoughts at it? We would be thrilled to have your thoughts, comments, preliminary draft, you know, whatever you want. Knowing that we're gonna take all of it and probably working with you and Philippe to really bring it all together. But we need your input because we are lay people, as you could see, and we're trying to incorporate and respect the rules of the game of design for whatever you're building. So if you would be willing to share the document with this group, or if anybody wants to add their name to the chat to be a part of the conversation, we'd love your input. That would be great if anybody on this call is interested. Um, it was a very, very interesting and 
um, rewarding exercise for me to go through this because it made me think. So um, uh, please put your email in the chat and we will make sure we send you yeah. a, um, a draft. Okay, I'm gonna start copy pasting those emails into a Word document. Right, because if we don't save the chat, we are, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we don't have access, just so everybody knows, the, the B, uh, Boston Society of Architects doesn't give us access to people's emails. All this is confidential. So that's why if people want to be involved, please drop your email in the chat. It'll be very, really nice. Yeah. Anybody else? With, from your experience, designing, trying to get some features and getting owners either excited about them or telling you it's too expensive, forget it kind of thing, we would like to hear. Is there anybody here on the call who does other than buildings, designing outdoor spaces, parks, uh, transportation? Mm -hmm. I guess it's very architectural. I'm silent because I'm copying and pasting. Please go ahead. Hi, Dana Slamaya from Icon Architecture. I just wanted to add a few comments um, coming from the affordable housing of senior. Um, developments that Philippe mentioned. I work almost solely in DHCD's Appendix K, which is their new design <laughs> guidelines for senior living, yes. which is like our Bible these days, right? Yes. Um, and yes. I think that that is the starting point to get some of these ideas out there, to start building that awareness in the design community, at least from the housing perspective. Because speaking to Philippe's comment about conflict, I mean, for instance, the, D, the, the QAP, you know, the, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program has all kinds of goals, accessibility, universal design, senior guidelines being one of them, but sustainability being another. So occupancy centers on lighting makes a lot of sense, but that's in, you know, in a dementia world, it's yep. not very friendly to have lights on and off, on and off when you walk into different rooms. So I'm thinking that is the first place to start to codify it or at least give bonus points for developers that do um, integrate that kind of friendly design into their programs. So that's obviously working with Kate Racer and the team at DHCD, but um, in my world, that, that would be a, a positive starting point. Great. Thanks, Janice. This is exactly the type of conflict that I was thinking about that our right. team really struggles with. And then the question is to, to the team here, Patty and Pam and James when he was here, is thinking about do we need to, do we need to achieve all these? six categories, right? Does every object, this is how, this is how things have to be communicated also to, to, to the team because not everything has to be familiar and distinctive and this and that. And communicating this to the architects or the developer is helpful for the people who don't really understand what dementia friendly design is to get them on board. So maybe in your outreach uh, to people in the community, <clears throat> or to architects, like these are not all or nothing right. categories. Well, if I can add to that, as well as giving concrete examples like the bench or the, the artwork of what makes distinctive versus um, familiar, you know, what was, what was it? Just, but, but it's all, it seems to be very subjective in the, um, application it's not black or white like a dimension either you meet that dimension or you don't so it's somehow finding a way to build a higher level of um, evaluation into it to say whether it's friendly or it's not i also think that from a 
point of view of distinctive um, that you can get, um, people could get lost if there's too much distinction in their environment. Yep. Um, oh, good point. It, it seems like you have to structure or have a hierarchy of distinction so that distinction really is there where it counts and isn't there when it creates a distraction. Um, because I think people with dementia have a lot of distraction anyway, and it leads to agitation. And so I'm feeling like we really have to scale back the distinction in situations where it's just not appropriate. Absolutely. Sensory overload is kind of mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. other direction that we, we need to mm -hmm. avoid. So walking, walking a balance. Yep. I think, Philippe, uh, one of the things I'm going to want to follow up with yes. you on is yes. the conflict. Because yeah. I haven't thought about that before. I don't think, Pam, you have either. Um, so we need to think through that. Yeah, uh, we, the, those those guidelines are out there. I can send those to you that I'm like me and Janice are very familiar with. They're the affordable housing guidelines. Uh, but we should look at not only for seniors, appendix K is only for seniors. We should look at the whole packet because also multifamily housing is also as important for it to be designed as dementia friendly than senior housing. Um, but that's why I was asking people here in the audience if there's other standards or guidelines that we're not familiar with that the state uses to procure that we should also look at and review and in, try to embed these categories in. Does, do people know if DCAM has a guideline standards? I'm not familiar with it as much. We could check, it's easy. I keep okay. listening to all of the um, examples for dementia and I have a child, adult child with special needs, a cognitive disability. And it's like so many of the items that you're talking about really are cognitive disabilities across the board. So it may be beneficial to broaden the subject matter to maybe reach a broader audience, dementia being a strong component of it. But so many of the things that are described, my son with cognitive disabilities deals with on a daily basis. So I'm wondering if there's a different avenue that, that um, not, maybe not different, but something that can um, get a broader audience um, to help disseminate information and educate um, might be possible as well. You know, Janice, we talk all the time about dementia, autism, special needs, they're all cognitive impairments. And it's so frustrating because people can't see them. And so they think they don't exist. And that's the challenge here, but your recommendation is a good one. And I know part of your effort, Patty, is to say the word dementia right, to help break down the stigma, it's important. So the outreach could be dementia and cognitive impairment solutions or guidelines, whatever. So dementia starts when you're 30, 35, um, early yeah. onset. So it, it's, um, that's all part of our education process is helping people understand what dementia means. And yes, it, your odds of experiencing dementia other than normal aging happens more when you get much older. But today at the MCOA conference, we listened to a group of people who were in their late 30s and early 40s who had early onset dementia. So it's, a, it's trying to figure out how we incorporate all of this tolerance into a tolerance, I'm sorry, that's the wrong word, but it's how we 
incorporate all of this acceptance in the, every aspect of the community. Okay. <clears throat> we have another 15 minutes if people have want to keep continuing the conversation. Patty, any last closing statement, something for us? Well, I, I'm thankful. So many people are interested in helping us in our work. So I have to thank you, Philippe and Ruth, for setting this up. And we'll be back in touch with our document and feel free to go at it uh, and you know, just remember it's written by a bunch of people who don't know anything about design or architecture. So we don't have your nomenclature, uh, but we're just trying to engage you in this really important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you to Pam and to James as well, who left us uh, before it's done. But yeah, thank you very much for for reaching out and including us in this phenomenal effort. So I have a list of seven emails plus myself and Ruth. This makes us nine people who uh, I believe you or James will be sending the email with the attachment to. And then hopefully the conversations between you and them and all of us can keep going. And with this, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.